the path of practice that we're following here is often called the middle way. As many of us tend to interpret that as right in the middle of our comfort zone, not too extreme, not too demanding. But the result is often that it's not too effective. The Buddha says there are two ways of gauging what kind of effort is just right. One is in term of, terms of your own strength. When you're sick and feeling physically weak, there's only so much you can do. And so at times like that, you have to adjust your effort to what is possible what you can manage. But when you're feeling stronger, you want to take into consideration what's really called for at any one particular time in your practice. And the Buddha says when you live at your ease and you find that the defilements are falling away, then fine, live at your ease. There's no need to go out and prove something by forcing yourself. But if you find that by living at your ease the defilements are just piling on, you've got to go out and practice, he said, with pain. Force yourself more than you want to, however much is needed for that particular defilement, that particular situation, that particular state of mind. And it's not the case that you always have to push yourself to the limit. The Buddha gives the analogy of a, a fletcher making an arrow. It's to put the arrow over the fire, to bend it one way, to bend it another way. The heat will cause the wood to expand so you can get the arrow perfectly straight. But once it's straight, then you don't have to put it over the fire anymore. What this requires is an awful lot of honesty on our own part, because the mind does tend to side with itself, saying, well, not too much. John Mahabhu has a great line. He says that when we're practicing, everything is just moderation, moderation, moderation. But when our defilements come in and we're following them, the word moderation or the word the middle way just disappears. You go with them all the way. whatever they require you. You're often up for it. So why is it when we're doing the path we're not up for what's required by the path? This is something you have to look into, and it's something each person has to look into for his or herself. And this is where you have to develop a lot of honesty. Are you getting results? What does it mean to get results? What happens when you push yourself harder? How long can you push yourself harder? What kind of stamina do you have? I've told you that story about the time when John Fu, out of nowhere, after a very hard working day, said, well, tonight we're going to sit up and meditate all night long. And then being brand new there, I complained to me, so I can't sit up tonight. I've been working all day. And John Fung said, is it going to kill you? Well, no. Well, then you can do it, he said. So you want to take that as your, as your guide. When you're sitting up late at night, say, well, okay, that's enough for now. You can ask yourself, well, sitting a little bit longer, is it going to kill you? And if you find that you're really falling asleep and there's no way you're going to wake up, you might as well go to sleep. But if you find that you can give yourself some more time, give yourself some more time. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. If there's energy, if you're up for it, stick with it. See how far you can go and see what results you get. If you don't experiment like this, you now have no standards with which to compare things. Because it's only after you push yourself too hard that you know what too hard is. And it's not going to kill you. 
we find that you've gone too far, we can back up a little bit. But all too often we're not willing to make that extra push. And the mind has lots and lots of excuses, starting with the term, middle way. Don't want to push yourself too hard, after all that turns into self-torment, and that's the wrong way. Well, how far is self-torment? Look at what the Buddha called self-torment, starving himself, forcing himself not to breathe, getting so thin that so malnourished that just the act of defecating or urinating would cause him to pass out. Now, have you gotten that far in your practice yet? No. We're not advocating that you go anywhere near there, but still. It is important that you push yourself more so you can learn what the range is. It's like getting a new stereo. You turn up all the dials to see what, what it's capable of before you decide what's right. The important point being here, your sense of honesty. What is getting results? A defilement comes up in the mind, greed comes up in the mind, lust comes up in the mind, aversion comes up in the mind, and you can look at it and it just drops away. Okay, you know you're making progress, but you find that it comes up and it just latches on. You have trouble shaking it. Okay, there's more work to be done. And this requires strategy, knowing how much you're capable of, and realizing we are in this for the long term. So the results may not be absolute, but at the very least you want to be able to see how the mind can drop a defilement as quickly as possible. Lust comes up, we'll just start taking the skin off. We've all seen the, the body shows. The, we know what's under the skin, and that's that's a pretty fine version. I mean, with the actual human being, there's blood and all kinds of other stuff that comes up. And if lust has taken hold of the mind, can you hold on to this perception? Which part of the mind says to drop it, drop it, drop it? You don't have to listen to it; just hold on. Or whatever perception the body can gives you a sense it really is unattractive and it's not worth the lust, and that you're a fool for getting involved with that. Because the problem with lust is not that just that it has imperfect objects that it focuses on, but all the things that we do under the power of lust. Remind yourself of those two, all the stupid things you've done in the past because of lust. Bring those to mind. And keep at it. The lust may still be there, lurking around, but you can just keep at it, keep at it. Just because it's still lurking there doesn't mean that it's not being weakened. Because at the very least, you're not giving into it totally. And that's important. The same goes with anger. The people you're angry at. How much longer do you want to hold on to that anger? What sense of self-righteousness is the, the meager and pretty sad food that you get from that anger? Can you hold on to the perception of that person being a suffering person? Someone worthy of compassion. Again, the, the root causes of anger may not go away, but it doesn't hurt to cut the grass off at ground level. And when you see it sprout up a little bit, cut it off again. Because what's really important is you learn to detect these defilements when they are still just tiny little shoots, just beginning to poke up off out of the ground. 
the more quickly you can catch that happening, the more easily you'll understand what's going on. Because all the various conversations and decisions that will help get, get a defilement into place all happen around those beginning moments. This is one of the reasons why we, we have the rules here at the monastery, the Vinaya for the monks. And it's not just for the monks, as John Sawat once pointed out. Having lay people live around monks who are observing a Vinaya, they get more sensitive too. But the whole purpose of the rules is to detect where there's some slight greed, where there's some, some slight anger, where there's some slight lust. If you keep care careful watch over your behavior, you begin to notice the slight ways in which these defilements display themselves in seemingly innocuous behavior. But if you really hold to the standards or the rules, you can't help but notice these things. A little sloppiness here, a little sloppiness there. Remember when I first went to stay with John Fuyang, and he would tell me about a John Mun, what it was like to live with a John Mun, how very precise and very careful and very neat a John Mun was about everything. And at first it struck me as a little bit obsessive. But then again, to realize that as you're looking after your mind, that's the little details. The slight movements of the mind, those are the ones you want to watch out for. And you see them very clearly when you've got the rules as your measuring stick. It's that line of a John Munz that very few people get their eyes blinded by having logs come into the eye. But sawdust can get into your eye very easily and it can blind you. It's the little things, the little defilements in the mind, the little actions that go against the rules. Those are the ones that can blind you to where the real work needs to be done. You can sit and look around and not see any defilements. Nothing seems to be wrong. But that's because your vision hasn't, hasn't been sharpened. Your powers of observation aren't clear enough yet. So the practice is in the details. The little things that we tend to overlook. And it doesn't hurt to be scrupulous. If you see part of the mind resisting, well, look at it, ask it, question it. What's the problem? And learn how to detect the, the tone of voice in the mind that indicates that that's a defilement talking. It's not me talking. I could identify with it if I want, but I don't have to. to learn how to test yourself. This is an important part of the practice. I've been looking at the different ways that the Buddha teaches questioning, because he does encourage questioning as part of the path. First there are the questions where you try to come by right view, get the right framework for the practice. And then there are the questions by which you observe yourself. Try to figure out how you're going to apply those views to your practice, and then gauge how well you're doing it. What are the standards by which practice is measured, by which progress is measured? Those questions are important, too. In fact, they make up a lot of the practice. The Buddha himself, as he was following this quest for awakening, kept questioning himself, questioning his actions. Why do I do this? How about if I did that? And then looking at the results he got, learning how to measure what's satisfactory and what's not. These are some of the ways in which we question ourselves. Are we putting enough effort in? Is the effort effective? How do you measure effective? What qualifies as satisfactory progress? When can you really be sure about yourself in the practice? And 
It's learning how to look in, into the details like this. That's where progress is found.